Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is John Eikenberry, and I'm co-director with Aaron Freeberg of the Center for International Security Studies, which is hosting this, uh, this event today. It's a real pleasure to welcome Professor John Gaddis back to Princeton for this uh, special event uh, sponsored by the Center. I think as everyone here knows, Professor Gaddis has had an extraordinary career, even without this new uh, multi-hundred page book that we're going to talk about today and that John is going to present today. For 30 years, Professor Gaddis has really been this country's leading scholar of American foreign policy and Cold War history. <clears throat> and he has played that role in writing a series of books, a sequence of works over many years that have helped define uh, academic and public debates on the causes and consequences of the Cold War and broader debates about America and the world. I'll just mention two books that have been important in my own uh, experience. Strategies of Containment, which was published in 1982, is still the definitive count of the rise and evolution of America's Cold, America's Cold War strategy of containment. If containment is the gold standard of grand strategies, uh, John's book on containment is the gold standard of studies, and uh, it has proved the test of time. The other book we now know, Rethinking Cold War History, is an important effort uh, later on in his career to rethink the Cold War in light of the end of the Cold War and in light of new documents and uh, materials that came out of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, in all of this work, uh, Professor Gaddis has exhibited a kind of thinking, rethinking, playing with, exploring ideas that has, again, marked his career throughout. And beyond this, uh, Professor Gaddis has also played an important role uh, in bridging the, uh, the professional tribes, if you will, between, in particular, his historical studies of, of foreign policy and international relations and political scientists who study international relations. But on top of all of this, Professor Gaddis has now come forward with an extraordinary new book, what by all accounts will be the definitive biography of America's most important, one of America's most important diplomats and foreign policy critics in the 20th century, George uh, Kennan. And it's an amazing accomplishment, a project that I think has spanned over 30 years when he was first approached and the years of research and waiting, I must say, uh, as well as research, uh, and the, the wonderful, beautifully written book, moving book in many ways uh, that has uh, been produced. And of course, it's altogether fitting that uh, John should be here today at Princeton to talk about this book because, of course, John Kennan, George Kennan, uh, has deep ties with Princeton, where he was a student here and where he spent his last 50 years as a resident here at, at Princeton and at the Institute for Advanced Study. Kennan, of course, left his mark on the world, but as John tells it in his book, uh, Princeton left a mark on Kennan, at least in his first years, where in the early part of the book, uh, John Gaddis writes uh, and quotes Kennan saying, Princeton left him with a, quote, vague Wilsonian liberalism, a regret that the Senate had rejected American membership in the League of Nations, a belief in laissez-faire economics and the values of competition, and a corresponding aversion to high tariffs, unquote. Uh, well done, Princeton. Uh, I also am honored to uh, introduce our discussant today, uh, Bart Gelman, who is most appropriate for this occasion. Bart is a leading uh, journalist and diplomatic writer who has had a very distinguished career, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, who was for 20 years a leading diplomatic correspondent for the Washington Post. He's now editor at large at Time Magazine. And last but not least, Bart, of course, is a Princeton graduate uh, who wrote his senior thesis on Kennan, supervised by Richard Ullman, a, a work that later became a published book. Uh, so it is wonderful to have him here as well, and he will comment on Professor Gaddis's presentation. Um, after the talk and after the setting uh, and the question and answer, there will be a book signing outside uh, uh, as well. So without further ado, will you join me in welcoming uh, Professor Gaddis to, to Princeton. Thank you so much. Um, John, thanks 
to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming out. Thanks, Bart, for agreeing to um, do this. It does feel like coming home. I think the first time I lectured in this auditorium was almost exactly 25 years ago. It's that semester that I spent here, courtesy of Fred Greenstein and Dick Allman. And uh, early in the semester, I gave a talk here in this auditorium, which was reported in the Princetonian, the lead in the Princetonian, was the young dynamic historian held the attention of his audience. <laughs> the Yale Daily News has never said anything like this about me. <laughs> It was also a memorable event because George Kennan came to the lecture and George and Annalisa were sitting right here in the front row and when they were introduced there was a gasp from the students sitting in the back of the room because it hadn't quite dawned on them that George Kennan was still very much alive. <laughs> and that was 1987. A um, particular pleasure to have Bart uh, here comment, commenting on whatever it is I'm going to say because um, no senior essay that I know of has ever been taken more seriously by its subject than Bart's senior essay was taken by George Kennan. Uh, Bart, as you know, wrote a book contending with Kennan, which came out of that senior essay. But George continued to brood about this book, what Bart said in essence was that uh, Professor Kennan had not yet developed a coherent political philosophy. <laughs> and so Bar and Professor Kennan resolved uh, in his mid-80s to develop a coherent political <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> and there was a book around the Craggett Hill, which really is in many ways a response to Bart Gelman. So it's a particular privilege, Bart to have you here. Now, there's a, some difficulty uh, after you have uh, finished a book of some 700 pages of trying to figure out what you can say about it, what you can possibly say about it that will not turn audiences into pillars of salt and thereby diminish book sales. <laughs> I've tried to list where you can get it. Uh, <laughs> um, you have to pick and choose, and uh, there really are several possibilities when it comes to George Kennan. I could talk about Kennan and grand strategy, because with the idea of containment, as John said, Kennan came closer than anybody else to having foreseen at the beginning of the Cold War how the Cold War would end some four decades later. Uh, and for setting the United States and its allies upon the path that eventually brought that about. This is Kennan with the first policy planning staff in 1947. Note its size. <laughs> um, I could equally well talk about Kennan as containment's most severe critic because no sooner had Kennan convinced the Truman administration to embrace the course of containment than George himself began trying to reverse it fearing that the United States in the act of seeking to contain the Soviet Union had become the more dangerous nation. And George, I think, continued to hold that view for uh, much of the rest of his life. Here's one of his many appearances before Senate committees testifying. I could talk about George Kennan's illustrious career as one of the first Soviet specialists in the United States Foreign Service and how that career prepared him for his role as the first director of the State Department policy planning staff, then as ambassador to the Soviet Union and later to Yugoslavia. But I could equally well explain how George saw himself as having failed miserably in the last three of those roles. I think he would credit himself with having been a pretty good foreign service officer, but I think he thought he failed at the policy planning staff and I know he knew he failed as ambassador to the Soviet Union and ambassador uh, to Yugoslavia. This is Kennan getting off the plane at Tempelhof in 1952, just about to make the unwise statement that got him kicked out of the Soviet Union, declared persona non grata, the only uh, American ambassador in the history of Russian-American relations to have been declared persona non grata. I could talk about Kennan's subsequent careers as a historian, as an early environmentalist, as a longtime anti-nuclear activist, as a constant critic of American culture. But I could also talk about his teaching, 
his farming, his poetry, his musicianship, and what I think should be his reputation as one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. But of course, this being Princeton, I could also talk about George Kennan as a longtime resident of this town for more than half a century, as John said. I'm particularly happy that Mary Bundy is with us uh, this afternoon because she did what I think is the best sketch of George Kennan ever done. Here it is. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, I could talk about George's extraordinary diary which he began keeping in 1916 and which he would continue to keep with gaps until the year 2003. Excerpts of which are soon going to be published under the editorship of somebody else who's here, who is Frank Custigliola, sitting right next to Mary Bundy. Uh, uh, and this uh, is going to be a tough job for Frank because this diary fills several thousand pages, most of them written in longhand. Uh, a hand that did not even begin to become shaky until Kennan was in his mid-90s, reflecting a mind that stayed clear really until the last year of his life. This is a page from George's diary in 1999. And look at the clarity of the handwriting. I could talk about what this diary reveals of dreams for George carefully chronicled dreams uh, for many years along with the contradictions those dreams revealed to himself about himself. I could talk about George as an insider who always felt himself to be on the outside. I could talk him about him as a patriot who loved his country but understood another country, Russia, much better. I could talk about him as an expert who saw his expertise as more often dismissed than drawn upon. I could talk about him as an advisor who saw his advice taken only when most casually given. I could talk about his uh, um, alarmism about the Soviet Union and the extent to which in later life he actually became an apologist uh, for the Soviet Union, had very different points of view on the Soviet Union. I could talk about him as an enthusiast for covert operations who came to want to abolish covert operations altogether. I could talk about him as a prophet who wound up being profoundly depressed by his own vindication. I could talk about him as a faithful Christian who could not help but wonder whether it had not been Jesus who created God rather than the other way around. And while George Kennan was arguably the most famous grand strategist of his age, I could also talk about him as someone who would have much preferred to have been the biographer of Anton Chekhov. So there is a lot to talk about. We could be here all week if I were to go on to all of this. If, as F. Scott Fitzgerald once wrote, the sign of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two contradictory ideas in the mind at the same time, then George's must be one of the greatest minds <laughs> of all time. Or I could talk about what it was like to work over some 30 years as Kennan's authorized uh, biographer. I figured out uh, the other day, shortly after the book came out, that I was Kennan's Boswell longer than Boswell was Johnson's Boswell. <laughs> and even here, though, there were contradictions. I'm glad you're at Yale and not at Princeton, George once told me. That way you're not always around and underfoot. <laughs> So, uh, there's a lot to talk about. Too much to talk about, really. Too much, really, even to fit within a 700-page book. This is going to have to be left to Frank. To um, How many volumes, Frank? Just one. Just one. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I thought I would do this afternoon is to talk instead about Canon and one particular subject. The, great, the subject is the great books, because it seems to me that an underappreciated aspect of Kennan's grand strategy is the extent to which it was based on the great literary and political and military classics that preceded the great classic that Kennan himself produced. And his great classic is, of course, this, 
the famous article, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, which appeared in Foreign Affairs in July of 1947, appeared with the author listed only as X, because Kennan had just at that time organized the policy planning staff at the State Department and the new Secretary of State, George Marshall. Actually, his first name was General George Marshall. <laughs> um, George Marshall expected the members of the policy planning staff to cultivate a passion for anonymity. Uh, but the X article remained anonymous for only about a week. Uh, and um, here's a cover that Time Magazine was going to do uh, just about two weeks after the uh, X article was published, after Kennan's cover had been blown. They never actually used it, but it shows how uh, famous or how notorious he suddenly had become at this point. Um, the reason uh, he became a public figure, the reason the X article did not remain anonymous, I think, was that it cited Edward Gibbon's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. The Kremlin, Kremlin leaders Kennan had written in the article were finding it necessary in Gibbon's phrase to chastise the contumacy, the, the rebelliousness that their own actions at home and abroad had generated. And even more strikingly, the X article uh, quoted and cited Thomas Mann's great novel, Buddenbrooks, as the basis for Kennan's famous prediction, which turned out to be correct in the end, that the Soviet Union would in time destroy itself from within. Because like the Buddenbrooks family in the Soviet Union, a formidable external facade concealed internal enfeeblement. And that enfeeblement, he argued, in 1947 was already well advanced. So why did these citations blow his cover? Well, I asked his longtime secretary, Dorothy Hessman, this question, and she said, oh, that's easy. Only uh, Professor, only Mr. Kennett, as he was then, uh, would have cited Gibbon and Thomas Mann. Nobody else in Washington would have done <laughs> that. So Kennan concluded from his reading of Gibbon and Thomas Mann, and said in the X article, quote, that Soviet power, like the capitalist world of its conception, bears within it the seeds of its own decay. The sprouting of those seeds is well advanced. So the United States could, he said, therefore enter with reasonable confidence upon a policy of firm containment designed to confront the Russians with unalterable counterforce at every point where they show signs of encroaching upon the interests of a peaceful and stable world. And I would argue that that big idea, the idea that the Soviet Union would in time destroy itself, was arguably the most important grand strategic insight that anybody had at any point during the Cold War. It's one that was vindicated with eerie precision four and a half decades after Kennan put it forward in the 1980s. To see that far into the future was remarkable, remains remarkable. But even more remarkable is the fact that it was Kennan's reading of two great books, both written well before anybody had ever heard of the Soviet Union, that provided the basis for his prediction. Now, I don't know when Kennan first read Thomas Mann, but I suspect it would have been in the late 1920s while he was in his own 20s, stationed in Weimar, Germany, or in the Baltic states. He would have read Mann, of course, in the original German, a language that Kennan had studied and spoken since childhood, having grown up in Milwaukee, a very German city. I do know, because I asked him about it, when he read Gibbon. It was on transatlantic airplane, airplane flights in uh, World War II. And because these planes required refueling and because diplomats did not have priority on them, these trips across the ocean by plane could take days to complete, sometimes as many as four or five uh, days. And because the planes were noisy, it was impossible to talk, it was difficult even to sleep, and so the only solution was to bring along Edward Gibbon, who crossed, <laughs> who crossed the ocean, I figure, something like seven times between 1942 and 1944 with George Kennan. All of which raises the question then, as to whether Kennan drew grand strategic insights from other uh, classical works, and if so, what those classical works might have been. 
Now, despite his reputation as a realist in his approach to international relations, uh, I have found lamentably little evidence that Kennan ever read Thucydides and the Peloponnesian War, which we read in the Yale Grand Strategy class. Maybe the Greeks were just too democratic for George, I don't know. Maybe the empire they ran was too small and too temporary for him to see the analogies to his own time. But as far as I know, he never read it, or if he did read it, he did not pay much attention to it. Nor did Kennan ever show much interest in or try to gain access to the Chinese grand strategic tradition which now has been so carefully reconsidered by another great American grand strategist, um, Henry Kissinger. It certainly is true that Kennan, uh, as early as 1947, anticipated the Sino-Soviet split, but here he was only echoing the views of his great friend, uh, John Peyton Davies, who was himself a China expert, uh, and this was just Kennan deferring uh, to Davies. However, when it comes to another classical grand strategist, another classical work, perhaps the most important work of grand strategy that anybody has ever written, when it comes to Clausewitz, Clausewitz was very important for Kennan. Uh, Kennan never tried to read all of On War. He certainly never read On War as carefully as he read The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And I think that's a good thing, because as I tell the Yale Grand Strategy students, the close reading of Clausewitz's incomplete and unwieldy classic will induce schizophrenia. It will make you go crazy <laughs> trying to uh, make sense out of it or to find consistencies uh, in it. You have to accept it as an incomplete text. You have to accept that it was originally written in German, and so it takes a very long time to get to the verbs. Uh, and uh, you uh, have to back off and seek out the major points, and that really is what Kennan did with some help from uh, an elegant summary of Clausewitz. It's still one of the best summaries of Clausewitz, done by the German emigre historian Hans Rufsfeld. Um, it appeared in Edward B. Earle's very influential edited collection of essays, Makers of Modern Strategy, published in 1943 in which some of the best historians in the country considered how the classical grand strategists could prepare American grand strategists for whatever role they would play. Obviously, it was going to be a big one uh, in the post-war era. And unlike many of Clausewitz's interpreters over the years, Rothfeld's got Clausewitz right, and it was through him that Kennan got Clausewitz right during his crash reading of Clausewitz in the summer of 1946, while devising the first uh, curriculum in grand strategy at any American uh, institution of higher learning. This was at the National War College uh, in 1946. Now, it's important to try to specify what it was that Kennan took from Clausewitz. And I think there are three big ideas. The first is the now familiar Clausewitzian concept that war must be a continuation of policy by other means, that war cannot be conducted separately from or independently of political considerations. Now, you have to remember that this was for Americans, for many Americans, uh, a new idea uh, in and immediately after World War II. They had preferred to think of war as something separate from politics they had preferred to think of war as something to be pursued as vigorously as possible to the point of victory, at which point, but only at which point, the politicians would then take over. And the best example of this kind of thinking was the call, or at least in George's mind, was the call uh, in World War II for the unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. Kennan thought this idea was crazy because the resulting power vacuum would only pave the way for the domination of Eurasia by the Soviet Union, a wartime ally that he was sure was going to become a post-war adversary. But Kennan found in Clausewitz strong support for the argument, the critique that he had been making of unconditional surrender during the war, uh, and also uh, the arguments that he put forward in his February 1946 long telegram from Moscow. Uh, all of which were making the point that the Soviet Union made no distinction at all uh, between war and policy, and that if the United States was to deal realistically with the Soviet Union in the post-war era, it would have to learn 
uh, to see these things as a unit, as a whole, rather than in separate compartmentalized boxes. Um, so that's one idea that Cannon took from Clausewitz. The second one, I think, was the idea that the purpose of military operations was not to produce as much violence as possible, but only enough to make a psychological impression on the mind of an adversary, an impression sufficiently strong to cause the adversary to stop doing whatever it was you objected to his doing. And here Clausewitz was restating the very old idea of proportionality, use just enough force to achieve what you need to achieve, but no more. An idea which can be traced back through the American founding fathers uh, and Machiavelli, uh, and even as far back as St. Augustine and Sun Tzu. This idea resonated with Kennan, as it did with many other Americans in the immediate post-war period, not only because of the disproportionate effects of strategic bombing in World War II, it was now evident what they were, as you could get into German cities, but also because of the far greater violence that would now be possible in wars if they were fought with atomic weapons. So uh, that was uh, an important uh, point as well that I think Kennan took from Clausewitz. The third idea, it seems to me, had to do with what Clausewitz had written about the virtues of defense over offense. Clausewitz had suggested that every offensive in time exhausts itself. Uh, it reaches a culminating point, as Clausewitz called it, a center of gravity, at which a minimal application of force in the other direction can reverse it. It's a point of leverage. It's vulnerability to leverage in Clausewitz's uh, thinking. You just have to wait patiently rather like uh, General Kutuzov during Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812 for that moment uh, to appear. So how does all of this, how do these Clausewitzian ideas connect with the strategy of containment as Kennan articulated? Uh, how does Gibbon connect with it as far as that goes? Well, I think Kennan's reading of Gibbon had convinced him that the Soviet Union had overextended itself by projecting its power whether by territorial acquisitions or by the creation of spheres of influence into the center of Europe. Uh, Gibbon had pointed out in the decline and fall that there was nothing more difficult than to attempt to hold conquered provinces indefinitely against the will of their inhabitants. They could only, these provinces, be sources of weakness in the long run, not sources of strength. Um, so Stalin, in Kennan's view, had followed the tradition of the overextended Romans, and certainly of Napoleon, taking control of half of Europe at the end of World War II in Kennan's mind, Stalin's doing that, was very much like Napoleon taking Moscow in 1812, or like Hitler's conquest of much of European Russia in 1942 and 1943. All of them, the Romans, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, had failed to answer one of the most important questions in grand strategy, which is having got what you want, what do you do with it? What do you do next? What's the next step? In such a situation then, and in such a condition of victorious befuddlement, which is what it amounts to, uh, Clausewitz had argued that a small push applied at just the right moment with carefully chosen means could reverse the momentum and gradually forced the invaders retreat at relatively little cost to one's self, all the better if this could be done without any fighting at all. And it's not just Clausewitz who came up with this idea, it was Sun Tzu who said the best war is the one that you never have to fight in the first place. So Kennan's instrument of reversal, of course, turned out to be the Marshall Plan of 1947 which was intended precisely to produce a psychological effect in the minds of Europeans as well as of Stalin to convince them that Europe's future need not be communism under Soviet domination. The Marshall Plan in this sense was a Kutuzov-like maneuver and it was one from which Stalin never completely recovered. Now, Clausewitz, of course, had served in the Russian army in 1812. And if you persist in reading War and Peace, Tolstoy's great novel, 
uh, if you get as far as page 771 in the new translation, you will actually find Clausewitz making a cameo appearance. Clausewitz rides by at the Battle of Borodino. He only gets about two sentences in Tolstoy, but he's there. Now, of course, Kennan knew Tolstoy very well, as he did the other great works of pre-revolutionary Russian literature. And I think it was through these works that he chiefly educated himself as a young foreign service officer uh, about the post-revolutionary Soviet Union, uh, but more particularly about something much more significant in his mind, which was the Russian national character. But exactly how did these great writers, uh, Pushkin, Turgenev, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and especially Chekhov, how did they help in shaping Kennan's grand strategy in the Cold War? Well, I think they provided this insight into what was stable, what would be lasting, what was deeply rooted, which was the Russian national character. Marxist-Leninist ideology, George believed, was not deeply rooted. It was an alien imposition. It's not, it was not going to hang on indefinitely. It was an aberration. One of the best illustrations of this, uh, I think, in terms of convincing him of this argument, had come in June of 1945 when George Kennan sent himself voluntarily to Siberia. It's a month after the end of the war. He had never been there, but of course he wanted to see the place and it was because of his great ancestor, the first George Kennan, the author of Siberia and the Exile System. Uh, the George Kennan, 1845 to 1924, who has confused so many students who have wondered why one George Kennan could live from 1845 to the year 2005. Uh, but this George Kennan, uh, seen here in his, on the lecture circuit, seen here in uh, Russian prison garb with clanking chains, which is how he used to lecture to audiences all over America about Siberia and the prison system, had a huge impact on the American image of Siberia as a prison of peoples. Nobody was more influential than the first, first George Kennan in that regard. And so the second George Kennan wanted to see uh, Siberia. And so he got permission to go out as far as Novosibirsk by train in June of 1945, toured some collective farms, as you see here, with the police watching every move that he made. He returned to Moscow by air from Novosibirsk. But that in itself was a trip that required uh, three days, several stops, and a good deal of improvisation, commandeering airplanes, enlisting the help of the KGB, all kinds of things, uh, just to get the connections uh, to get back to Moscow. And on the flight from Novosibirsk to Omsk, uh, George sat next to a babushka, an illiterate old woman, who charmed him. He kind of fell in love with her as she regaled him with observations on life reflecting, as George wrote in his diary, all the pungency and charm of the mental world of those who had never known the printed word. George shared his lunch with her, uh, sitting on the tarmac under the wing of the plane in Omsk, it was a hot day, and he pulled out Tolstoy and he began reading it aloud uh, to the babushka. I don't know which Tolstoy, it doesn't matter, but it was Tolstoy. And George's Russian was wonderful classical Russian, not what uh, most people then were used to hearing uh, in the Soviet Union. Not only did he have the babushka enthralled, but he had the whole uh, passenger list of the plane gathering around and listening to him read Tolstoy uh, aloud. And I think it was a very important moment for George because it suggested that at the highest point of Soviet power, um, the Soviet Union's hold, communism's hold on Russia and its people was a good deal weaker than superficial appearances uh, might have appeared. There was a past which was going to be the future, and I think that's what George saw on that day as he read Tolstoy to the babushka with a reaction, something like this famous photograph of Tolstoy and kids. And then on top of this, there is the first university lecture, as far as I can tell, that George Kennan ever gave. And I'm pleased to say it took place at a university just up the road uh, on October the 1st, 1946. Um, 
This was just after uh, George had started teaching at the National War College. The chief target of this Yale lecture was the former Vice President of the United States, Henry Wallace, who had just been sacked from the cabinet of the new president, Harry Truman, uh, because Wallace had insisted that the only choices available to the United States in its relationship with Stalin's Soviet Union were conciliation on the one hand or a new world war on the other. Kennan thought otherwise. Kennan thought there was a third way. And he devoted the last few pages of his Yale lecture to showing that there was a third way. But he showed it, and I think this really must have puzzled the Yale audience. He showed this by devoting the last third of his lecture to recounting a Chekhov short story. This is his text. And those single-spaced uh, passages that you see uh, are from, uh, oops, what's happened here? I think we've lost it. Let's try. Excellent, good. I just knocked that loose, I'm sure. That's the text. And you see the single-spaced passages uh, that are there. Um, the uh, short story, the Chekhov short story, is called The New Villa. And it's about the well-meaning owner of an estate who had tried to befriend its peasants in order to reform their lives. But the owner of the estate had got nowhere with uh, the peasants. And she walked away sadly, but she was followed by a sympathetic blacksmith. Uh, this is what Kennan read to the Yalees. Don't be offended, mistress, said Rodion. Wait a couple of years, and you can have the school, and you can have the roads, but not all at once. If you want to sow grain on that hill, first you have to clear it, and then you have to take all the stones off, and then you have to plow it up, and then you have to keep after it and keep after it, and it is just the same with people. You have to keep after them and keep after them until you win them over. I can use this passage from Chekhov at Yale to make an important point. What he was suggesting is that people could reshape even the most tyrannical governments, but it would take time to do this. And circumstances, not Henry Wallace-like sentimentality, uh, would shape people. So I think therein lay the key to what the American strategy of containment in Kennan's mind should be, to create the circumstances over time that would leave the leaders of the Soviet Union with no choice but to reshape their country patiently and non-provocatively, to keep after them and keep after them until you had won them over. Now, when Kennan gave this lecture at Yale in 1946, Mikhail Gorbachev was uh, a 15-year-old kid. It would be another 39 years before Gorbachev would come to power. But I think Kennan saw him coming that day in October of 1946, well before Gorbachev saw himself coming. And Kennan did this by drawing on an image, really a metaphor, from the Russian writer he most admired, whose biographer uh, he really had hoped to be. That was his great aspiration in life to be Chekhov's biographer. So just to conclude, why the affinity for Chekhov, which is reflected so clearly throughout George Kennan's life? Well, I think maybe it was because of the death of George's mother uh, two months after he was born in 1904, two months before Chekhov died. Uh, that's George's mother, uh, 1860 to 1904, and you see young George there. 1904 to 2005. And why do I think uh, that there was a connection to his own mother uh, in this um, uh, here? It's because uh, about five years before George died, my wife Tony and I came to Princeton as we would tend to do about every year and uh, had lunch with George and Annalisa. And Tony, who runs the theater program, undergraduate theater program at Yale, was uh, directing the Cherry Orchard at that time. And she and George got into a conversation about Chekhov. I was just sitting there uh, as a witness to this. But somehow George got off on telling the story, another short story, 
called The Step, about a little boy who is being sent off to school uh, across the Great Step uh, on a hay cart driven uh, by peasants propelled by oxen. He's on a great load of hay. He's riding along at the top of it, and the trip takes days. And the little boy has no idea where he's going. The landscape is featureless. The great sky is above at night. The stars are shining, and the little boy is profoundly lonely. And as George told us this story, this is in 1999, uh, tears began coming down his cheeks. And that was a tip-off to me that uh, there's something here about Chekhov. There's something here about loss. There's something here about mothers. Uh, and there's something here that never left George Kennan. There was a tragedy in his life that never left him. And this is how oral history really can become so important to the writing of a biography. And this is why it is so important. This is why I was so fortunate to be able to go beyond the archives and actually know these people, um, because this would never have shown up uh, in the archive. I think it's extraordinarily important. Chekhov appealed to Kennan, I think, for other reasons as well. I think maybe it was Chekhov's uh, self-control, uh, in part. I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that the idea of containment itself had something to do, in Kennan's mind, with Chekhov's ability in his plays and stories to say a lot with a little. You read them the first time, you don't think anything is happening, and you have to read them several times to figure out that a lot is happening. Um, I think, in part, it was the experience of having bought a farm George and Annalisa, having bought a farm uh, just outside the curiously named village of East Berlin, Pennsylvania, <laughs> which was East Berlin before the other place was and continues even now to be East Berlin, long after the other place has ceased to be. This was in 1942. It's when George returns from internment in Nazi Germany. It was a great rambling house. Here's a picture of it from the 1950s. Uh, it was uh, way more than they could afford in 1942. Uh, the house and the 238 acres cost $14,000, which was much more than they could afford. But Annalisa turned to George and said, George, the house is just like the house in the cherry orchard. And so they bought it. And it turned out there was only one cherry tree on the whole place, as I can tell. <laughs> which on the first night that they were there, George climbed to observe his property. But they called it the cherry orchard uh, for a while. Uh, not always, but early on, they would refer to it as the cherry orchard. So there's that connection as well. But I like to think that the Chekhov connection had even more to do with another house, which is halfway around the world, um, at a place called Yalta, which is the last house in which uh, Chekhov lived. And completed in 1898, it looked something like this um, in the period when Chekhov lived there. This is Chekhov's uh, white dacha at Yalta. When he bought the house and when he began to plant the garden, Chekhov knew that he was dying. He was a doctor. He knew, had known for 20 years that he had tuberculosis. But he used a great deal of his time in Yalta, having bought the house, to plant a garden knowing that he would never see the garden in full bloom. And here's a picture of uh, Chekhov in the last year of his life, only about four months before he dies in his garden. You can see the plants are staked. They're just beginning to grow. Uh, down in the corner uh, next to him, you see a vague outline of what looks like a crane, a bird, and it is. It's a wild crane that would come and visit Chekhov every summer. Uh, the crane liked Chekhov, and Chekhov liked the crane. And so it would fly off to parts unknown other times of the year, but it would always come back to Yalta and to, check, to see Chekhov, to visit Chekhov, and that's a photograph of the crane. This is March 1904. George Kennan is only a month old when this photograph is taken. He was able to visit the house in the garden 33 years later in 1937 while he was stationed in Moscow found no photographs of that visit, but we can assume that the plants had grown a good deal. But uh, Tony and I had the privilege of being in Yalta on an alumni trip uh, last summer, and this is what the garden looks like now. 
which is no doubt what Chekhov intended it uh, to look like. Now, what does all this have to do with Kennan's 1946 talk at Yale, or with his farm in East Berlin, or with the larger grand strategy of containment that George was developing at that time? Well, here's something he wrote a few years later, and he repeated this basic idea uh, many times. His thinking on this was very close to that of Dean Acheson, also a farmer, and Acheson often wrote about this too. Uh, but here's what George said. We must be gardeners and not mechanics in our approach to world affairs. International life, uh, he added, was an organic process. It was not a static system. The Americans had inherited it. Uh, they could not design it or redesign it. Their preferred standards of uh, behavior could hardly govern it. But it should be possible, he wrote, to take these forces for what they are and to induce them to work with us and for us by influencing the environmental stimuli to which they are subjected. This would have to be done gently and patiently with understanding and sympathy, not trying to force growth by mechanical means, not tearing the plants up by their roots when they fail to behave as we would wish them to. The forces of nature will generally be on the side of him who understands them best and respects them most scrupulously. So more than anyone else, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me that it was George Kennan who showed in the mid-1940s that one need not resort to either war or appeasement in dealing with the challenge posed by the Soviet Union, that with patience there could be a third way. Now, Kennan would have been the first to admit that he himself was not always patient, um, or even often patient. He did not often practice what he preached in this regard, hence his multiple contradictions, which so often exasperated his contemporaries, even if they, as they have fascinated his biographer. But on the whole, Kennan was right, and he lived to see the seeds he planted in the 1940s, however precariously, vindicate him. Chekhov, of course, was not as fortunate. Chekhov did not live to see the seeds he planted at Yalta over 100 years ago grow into this great garden that delights visitors to his dacha today. But I like to think that one or two of the seeds that Chekhov planted so long ago took root in the mind of his failed biographer, uh, George Kennan, with the result that the two of them collaborated with surprising success in the saving of Western civilization. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, John. I am not going to uh, burden uh, uh, this this uh, room with a long uh, formal uh, response. I'd much rather hear you talk, and I'd like to engage you a bit in conversation uh, at first, and then open it up to uh, the floor. Uh, so you're getting to read my email. <laughs> we can we can pause for that. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember uh, uh, I, I was writing my thesis uh, on Kennan uh, the same year, 1982, that Strategies of Containment was published. And I was aware, as I uh, worked in the Sealy Mudd Library uh, just down the street, uh, that I had access to something under, I think, 100 boxes uh, of the Kennan papers, and that uh, this guy Gaddis, then at Ohio State, uh, had exclusive Ohio. access to uh, at Ohio. Sorry, uh, yeah. to uh, what some 300 boxes. Uh, well, not quite because there were not that many boxes there. There were still most of the boxes were us ah. over at the institute. But I did have access to what you did not have access to. You're correct. Indeed, I was I was uh, I was uh, bitterly jealous of this and had fantasies of breaking in at night to uh, <laughs> if I had any idea there were 20,000 pages of diaries. I uh, with a, my <laughs> thesis due, I probably would have thought twice. Well, even more, George insisted that any researcher using the Kennan papers at that period take notes in longhand 
hand. They were not, you were not allowed to photocopy. And one of my conditions for becoming his authorized biographer would be that I would have the authority to photocopy. So <laughs> I'm photocopying, her Bart is writing things out in longhand. <laughs> uh, which was uh, with a quill pen back in those yeah, days, yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Now, I am obviously humiliated uh, by the hubris of a 21-year-old uh, telling uh, Kennan he has no coherent uh, uh, philosophy. Well, I, and I don't didn't know. It stop you. <laughs> did, did not stop. <laughs> well, it, it doesn't tend to stop the, uh, the what's the corresponding uh, adjective uh, to sophomoric when you're a senior? Uh, in any case, I, I, I am very glad that he picked the biographer he did. This, this volume is just extraordinary magisterial uh, biography. Uh, I have very seldom read a book of 700 pages that had no fat, that this sort of economy and clarity and almost conversational quality of the prose uh, while mastering this whole body of evidence is, uh, it does justice to George Kennan, which is Thank you. saying a lot, I think. Uh, I, I'm quite interested in, uh, in the gardening metaphor as a way of starting us off. Because Kennan was writing for uh, a, a city full, of, uh, buildings full of mechanics mm -hmm. who believed mm -hmm. in pulling the levers of power. Uh, this whole gardening thing made so little sense to them that, uh, I mean, among many, many famous uh, sort of explosions of, of uh, frustration was Gene Rostow's. when he said that of Kennan that his mind um, doesn't move along uh, mathematical lines, uh, never will, that Kennan is an impressionist, a poet, not an earthling. Uh, <laughs> talk a bit about how Kennan's sort of way of perceiving the world organically uh, did and did not work no. when he tried to influence no. policy. Well, I, I quote that line in the book, and I say it's the first and only time that George was ever called an extraterrestrial, <laughs> an alien. Um, I think his mind did work, or I know his mind worked uh, organically, and it was because he respected history, and it was because he respected culture. And culture and history, uh, and certainly literature, cannot be reduced to systems. Uh, they cannot be turned into a social science. Uh, you have to look at how they evolve. If you're studying literature, you study very carefully how a particular writer evolved in his or her career. If you're studying history, of course you're talking about an organic uh, process, uh, not a static uh, system. And I think the same is true if you're talking about culture as well. So it seems to me this was deeply rooted um, in George Kennan. And when in the immediate post-World War II period, the social sciences began to come into vogue, and the social sciences even infiltrated uh, Princeton at that point. And uh, <laughs> President Dodds, for whom this auditorium is named, tried to recruit uh, George Kennan to serve as an advisor for one of the new social science uh, institutes that was being created um, here. Uh, and he got quite an earful on paper from Kennan uh, on the complete failure of the social sciences to have anything to do uh, with, with reality. And I think that view, uh, I think that view uh, was uh, very critical to George Kennan's uh, view, uh, uh, not just of politics and foreign policy, but his outlook uh, on life. I've always thought it ironic that he coexisted at the Institute for Advanced Study with uh, John von Neumann and one of the world's first computer, which was in the basement of the same building where uh, Kennan uh, was, uh, and where much of the early research on game theory uh, was done. But George just did not think in these, in these terms. And, uh, I don't think he was alone in this. I think there were other people, plenty of other people in Washington at the time uh, who, who thought this. Um, Atchison certainly was one himself. Uh, but I'm not sure anyone quite articulated it as successfully as Kennan did. And so when Kennan turns the power of his prose onto something like this, uh, whether it's in a, a speech or whether it's in uh, the X article or, or whatnot. Just the compelling nature of his writing itself, it seems to me, causes people to read this and say, ah, but we've known this all along. 
but nobody has ever said it before. And I think that is uh, really uh, kind of the key to understanding Kennan's influence. Not that his ideas were totally original, but that he could say them uh, so much better than anyone else. Which really comes back to something else that is not easily reduced to a social science, which is good writing. Yeah. Right, but correspondingly, uh, when someone would say to him, in effect, you paint a pretty picture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it, I, I can imagine all of it. Uh, your, the sweep of history, your judgment about Russian character, your predictions about what Moscow's leaders will or will not do, but how do I know it's true? Well, how do, I, how do you account for this? He, he didn't... He, he could not reply very effectively in that, in that language. Well, what he would reply, the way he would reply, would be to say, trust me. <laughs> I'm a Soviet expert. <laughs> uh, and that's what it came down to. And of course it was not particularly uh, effective in persuading, particularly people who were very worried. Uh, he was not very effective in telling the Europeans that they did not need NATO, for example, and it had been their idea in the first place to build NATO, and uh, George said they didn't need it because the Russian army was not going to attack. Well, the Russian, he was right, the Russian army did not attack. But nonetheless, they felt the need for the reassurance, and when he said, trust me, this did not really uh, influence them very much. I think it's something else, Bart, that is uh, important to stress here. And that is uh, someone who is or has the temperament of an artist, um, whether that's reflected in historical writing or literature or whatnot, coming into government um, does tend to fail to see sometimes uh, the need that government has uh, for a uh, course to be set. And once you've got the course set, uh, uh, government is like a super tanker. Once you have the course set, you cannot turn it on a, on a dime. And this was the difference with Atchison, because Atchison took the view that, uh, yes, we set the course, and George Kennan played a major role in setting the course. But then when George would begin to worry about the contrary winds and currents that were blowing us off course, this is when Atchison would get very impatient with him because Atchison would say, of course, there are going to be contrary winds and currents, and of course, we have to adapt to these. And sometimes we have to do the opposite of what we did yesterday. And uh, don't expect philosophical consistency uh, here. Don't stay up uh, late nights worrying about this. Uh, Mary was uh, extremely persuasive to me in, expecting, uh, in explaining the, the thinking of her father on just this point, that he would not uh, brood or agonize uh, about having to go in a different direction. Uh, he would just do it and not lose sleep. That's not George. George would worry about uh, consistency, would worry about this constantly. Uh, so I, I think that part of it, his temperament uh, did not really equip him for in government. Well, temperament is, of course, something you spend a lot of time on throughout. And uh, there's this marvelous uh, duality uh, that you describe between a man who did have as much influence on the strategic doctrine of his generation as anyone ever has, and yet it is hard to think of examples of someone more miserable for more decades uh, about his legacy. Uh, how, how do you, how do you uh, explain that? It's, um, it's very tough. And I can only think of maybe a couple of other examples, at least in American history. I'm struck, struck by the, um, it's almost an Adams family syndrome. And I'm stuck, uh, struck by the uh, similarity to John Quincy Adams, who grew up under this horrible set of expect uh, parental expectations. You know, if your parents are John and Abigail Adams, it's not easy being a kid. Uh, and so. John Quincy Adams throughout his life suffered from the same sense of anxiety which he chronicled in a diary which is even longer than George Cannon's diary as well. And then of course it transferred genetically all the way down to Henry Adams whose education, the uh, book The Education of Henry Adams uh, reflects this uh, business of trying to live up to a legacy and uh, all of that as well. Uh, Cannon did not have famous parents that he had to uh, live up to. But I think that there was uh, something else. I think that somehow psychologically uh, the loss of his mother uh, just created a void 
which could never easily be filled. Uh, he himself told me on the first day we began talking about this biography that this was going to be very important and I should uh, uh, take this uh, into account. And I think what it meant was uh, that uh, he was never comfortable anywhere. He could never be at ease anywhere. He was always in his own mind an outsider everywhere. And I think that had some of the same psychological effect that perhaps uh, uh, may have existed with uh, John Quincy Adams. The thing that they had in common was that they could never satisfy themselves. They held themselves to impossibly high standards. And I think it happened for different reasons in these two people, but I think they had that much in common. So if you would congratulate them for having successfully set forward the Monroe Doctrine, for example, or the strategy of containment or something, uh, they would deflect the congratulations you know, and uh, immediately start criticizing what they had done. And this was very much the way George was, at least in my own uh, experience. Well, but he was also, and perhaps principally criticizing uh, what others did with his ideas. Uh, his, his belief that his ideas had almost immediately and for some decades after been distorted uh, into an over-militarized, over-messianic uh, American foreign policy. Oh yes, but he also blamed himself for not making himself, having made himself clear, you see. Uh, and that led to the distortions. If only I had written, if only I had written the X article more clearly, you know, he would say. Uh, and so I think it still was uh, making great demands on, on himself and never really be, being comfortable with himself right. in this regard. So, so there's I, that, and another piece of this, another, you know, yet another duality with Kennan is that uh, he, he was disinclined to think that most people were capable of understanding him. Uh, he, uh, you mentioned that the Greeks may have been too democratic for him. His, uh, his elitism, his, uh, his, 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 uh, his, his ideas about governance were, were uh, fairly extraordinary. Do you want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Sure. <laughs> well. Um, I've gotten some flack from the reviewers. Um, I've forgotten whether Frank complained about this in his review or not, but uh, some of the reviewers have complained about the subtitle, uh, which is An American Life. And the reviewers have said, uh, surely this is an accident. <laughs> which I regard as an insult. I mean, you do not work on a book for 30 years and then have an accidental <laughs> subtitle. <laughs> And what I meant by that was to try to take into account this great paradox uh, that he was deep, fundamentally, uh, almost religiously, an American patriot. There's just no question in my mind uh, about that. Uh, this is someone who could, when he would hear an American accent in some foreign capital, was capable of bursting into tears. This is someone who, uh, 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 when, um, invited to speak at a Memorial Day service in 1953 uh, by the farmers who were the neighbors in Pennsylvania, developed a speech that borders on the eloquence of Lincoln at Gettysburg, uh, not far away uh, on a similar occasion. Uh, this is someone who held his country to uh, such high standards that he felt that his country never came close to those standards. And I think that uh, helps to explain his uh, anti-democratic uh, views. Uh, he certainly idealized America. The America he talked about was a less democratic America. It was the America of the 19th century, the early 20th century, the America that he had grown up with, uh, the America where uh, everybody traveled uh, either by horse and buggy or by train, but no automobiles or airplanes or anything like that the America where uh, California was a very long way away and nobody went there, and that was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, it was a, an impossibly idealized view uh, of uh, America. Uh, but it does not mean that he was un-American. I mean, it means just the opposite, that he had this um, really uh, high, exceedingly high standard. And, I would connect that with what I was saying about himself. You know, I think he held himself to extraordinarily high standards. 
uh, and that shows up in the, in the diaries as well, just as he held his country to uh, very high standards. So uh, it's confusing on the surface. It certainly can appear to be uh, anti-democratic, and certainly if you cherry pick from what he wrote at various points, it's more than anti-democratic. You know, it's, it's shocking, it's scandalous, it's uh, politically, to say that it's politically incorrect is to put it much too mildly in some cases. But I think you have to look at the entire context of his writing and uh, not take out of context uh, these uh, horrors that you will find occasionally uh, in his writing. I think you can find horrors at one point or another in almost everybody's writing, and the context is what's really important. I'll ask just one more now and then yeah. open it up. You, you bring us forward to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, your, your title for chapter 24 is Precarious Vindication. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by this time, as we've just been discussing, he's quite miserable about uh, the vindication. He, he, he doesn't believe he has been vindicated because he believes the United States has paid much too high a price in distorting its mm -hmm. own society and its foreign policy uh, in order to achieve the outcome. Uh, you, you, there's a moment you record a dinner party in which uh, he uh, bitterly denounces Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and you ask the question, uh, if anyone thinks I've been on Facebook, I've got uh, the book on here. Uh, it's a lot lighter than the hardcover. Okay. Uh, I have both. Uh, uh, you, you write of Ken in, uh, and on what he says about Reagan. His attitude itself bordered on the outrageous. How could he have loved John F. Kennedy, who repeatedly rejected his advice and loathed Ronald Reagan, whose action in this and other respects were consistent with it. How, how do you answer that question? Well, guess what? I'm going to pitch this right over to Jack Matlock, who knew both men well, and who uh, I think actually tried to bring them together in a way. Uh, I'm thinking, Jack, particularly about uh, the uh, January 1984 speech and the way in which you alerted George uh, to that. But uh, you are probably in a better position than anybody else in the world, actually, to answer this question. So this is, sir, your question. And uh, like, like uh, George Kennan, a, a former ambassador to, mm -hmm. to Moscow. <coughs> <laughs> uh, how, how do we explain the, the disenchantment with Reagan, who, uh, who uh, John describes as coming nearer to taking Kennedy's advice than John F. Kennedy did? To, or to put it another way, Jack, um, you know, I argue in the book, and you have said the same thing in print, that Ronald Reagan's uh, ideas uh, about the Cold War and about the Soviet Union really fundamentally were very close to those of George Kennan. So the question, I think that all of us are puzzled by, is why George Kennan could never understand this. He could never connect with Reagan. It was not just a matter of not meeting Reagan, but it was that he could not understand uh, where Reagan was going, uh, at the, uh, particularly in the second term. He did not take into account, was unaware of, uh, paid no attention to Reagan's nuclear uh, well, I think what, what you know? It's on. It's on. It's on. Yep. I think what put Kennan off, most of all, was what he considered the rhetoric, mm -hmm. um, Reagan's rhetoric, and he, he didn't grasp that basically Reagan, I would say, hated nuclear weapons more mm -hmm. uh, even than Kennan did, mm -hmm. perhaps. Mm -hmm and that fundamentally their ideas were not that different. However, the way they expressed them mm -hmm. were quite different. Now, the way Kennan expressed them, he, he could have never persuaded the Senate uh, to ratify the INF Treaty using Kennan's arguments. Uh, Reagan could because he, he had sort of insulated himself from the right Mm -hmm. uh, by the rhetoric, uh, and in effect, he couldn't be outflanked from the right. Mm -hmm. But in the disarmament area, uh, and the same might be said of such things as, uh, as having diplomatic relations with China, a democratic president probably couldn't have gotten it done. Mm -hmm. You needed a Republican president who could not be, in effect, crushed by the right. Mm -hmm. 
and in that way, I think that uh, Kennan probably began to understand it later. Because when I called him and explained in advance some of Reagan's speeches, particularly the one in January 84, regarding the Soviet Union, he was delighted. And he liked about everything in it. And the only question in his mind then is, does Reagan really believe this? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to ask oh, people to come down I would to say, the microphones while you yeah. wait to ask another question. I would, I would say, Jack, that he liked that speech for about three days. But then he starts raising exactly these uh, questions. Uh, so uh, I think the style which you alluded to is just a huge difference. But I think there's something even deeper in, in what you say, which is that Reagan, of course, was a, a politician, a very successful politician. George Kennan is about as far from being a politician as it's possible to imagine. Uh, and it's interesting to think about what that means because uh, it seems to me being a politician uh, involves the ability to, uh, to uh, move in one direction, which may be the opposite from where you want to wind up, but you have to do it for a political reason and move back in another direction. Uh, being a politician really involves uh, uh, skill at sequencing knowing what to do now and knowing what to postpone and what you have to wait to do later on and so on. The great politicians, it seems to me, FDR, Reagan, uh, had that skill. I just don't think George Kennan ever came anywhere close to having that skill, to knowing uh, about sequencing, to knowing uh, when the right time was uh, to just put that off and leave that issue there and wait for another 10 years or so. You didn't have the ability to do that. Professor. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to see you, John. Thanks for your excellent mm -hmm. presentation. Um, I, uh, my question really feeds off this uh, most recent discussion. Mm -hmm. And I've always seen uh, Kennan as a great strategist, but not as a great grand strategist. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that his bosses, George Marshall and Dean Acheson, were better grand strategists than Kennan was, mm -hmm. precisely because they took domestic politics seriously mm -hmm. in building an actual implementable strategy. So they took things like the Truman Doctrine seriously, they took things like NSC 68 seriously as a way of selling the package of containment to a skeptical Congress and a skeptical mm -hmm. public. And this isn't really a question, I just like your reaction to the, to, the, to the statement, and that is that the gardening metaphor seems a strange one to me, because mm -hmm. when I was listening to the gardening metaphor and thinking about the gardening metaphor, which is uh, uh, present in your, in, in your writing, um, it seemed to me that, that he didn't like the fertilizer. He didn't like turning <laughs> over the rocks that are necessary to actually get a strategy in place. Mm -hmm. So if you think it organically, someone like Marshall understood the American public and he understood the Congress mm -hmm. and he understood how to get the Marshall Plan mm -hmm. through and the compromises that needed mm -hmm. to be made. Uh, uh, Atchison understood these things too, and that's why he supported NSC 68, mm -hmm. although he's not n normally associated with NSC 68. Sure. Mm -hmm. Atchison supported it because mm -hmm. that was the fertilizer that was necessary to have a strong enough stand in Europe to contain the Soviet mm -hmm. Union without implementing yep. everything. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a long yep. statement, but I'd, I'd be interested in your reaction to that. Well, I think what you've raised is a, a very deep question and a problem about studying and teaching grand strategy, and it's something that we wrestle with in our course uh, all the time. Um, what are the standards for success in grand strategy? How would you regard Bismarck? You know, we normally think of Bismarck as a successful grand strategist because of the way that he unified Germany. But then just uh, use a little bit longer time frame and think about what the consequences of unifying Germany were and Bismarck's inability to perpetuate his own skill when he was uh, uh, deposed uh, by the Kaiser and then look at what that led to. So part of the answer is that um, when you are evaluating the success of strategies, the time scale that you use is uh, uh, very critical. So I would have no question. Uh, I would certainly agree with what you say about Marshall and Atchison um, in the short run. Uh, I would even add um, Henry Kissinger to this list uh, as well. Um, and I would say in the short run, meaning a fairly long run, actually, you know, meaning um, the <coughs> middle point of the Cold War and whatnot, uh, they are successful. George Kennan is, is not. But then what about the very long run? What about foreseeing how the Cold War is going to come out? Marshall didn't see that. I don't think Atchison ever clearly saw it. Uh, 
I'm quite sure Henry Kissinger never clearly saw it, although Henry and I argue about this uh, frequently. <laughs> <coughs> but the idea, uh, and this is the connection to Reagan, the idea that Kennan had, <clears throat> which is based on his reading of the great literary classics, that Marxism, Leninism, communism, the Soviet Union itself is an artificial imposition on the Russian national culture and is not going to last. That is seeing uh, something like half a century into the future or more, you see. Uh, and so by one standard, that's hugely successful as grand strategy. But if your standard is to look at short-term performance, or if your standard is to look at building a constituency, or if your standard is to look at um, <clears throat> navigating what, <clears throat> what Clausewitz would call friction along the way, then I think Kennan was terrible at it. So it really depends on what framework you use, it seems to me, um, in this regard. Mm -hmm.